Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. April showers bring May flowers, and we've got a shower of updates, new research, and new content this month. Starting off with our research roundup. A paper published in the Journal of the Alzheimer's Association has revealed the results of a phase one clinical trial of stem cells for Alzheimer's disease. As a phase one trial, This study was focused on safety rather than effectiveness. It included people with mild Alzheimer's disease and involved mesenchymal stem cells as it is believed that they could aid in the reduction of amyloid beta deposits. During the study, 8 people were given placebo, 15 people were given 20 million stem cells, and 10 people were given 100 million stem cells. The results were promising. Adverse events occurred more often in the placebo group than the treatment groups, and no adverse events were determined to be related to the infusion. The researchers also analyzed multiple biomarkers related to neurodegenerative disease, including vascular endothelial growth factor. This is known to have positive and protective effects on the nervous system, and while it degrades with Alzheimer's disease, it was maintained in the low-dose group and actually increased in the high-dose group. Interleukin-4 which has anti-inflammatory effects and known positive effects in the context of Alzheimer's disease, was maintained in the treatment groups but decreased in the placebo group. Interleukin-6, which protects against glucose toxicity, was significantly higher in the high-dose group than the placebo group. Perhaps most importantly, the volume of the hippocampus, the part of the brain associated with memory, was significantly higher in the high-dose treatment group than either of the other groups. In total, these results are very positive for a phase one clinical trial. A new study published in Nature Communications has found that rapamycin, which is often considered to be a caloric restriction mimetic, has different and additive effects to caloric restriction in muscle tissue. Restricting the calories of male wild-type mice at 15 months or 20 months of age, the researchers discovered that caloric restriction helped in some physical ways. Both fat and lean mass were reduced in the caloric restriction groups with a minimum influence on strength. With less weight to carry, the restricted mice were much more able to hang on to an upside-down grid than their freely fed counterparts. In fact, 30-month-old restricted mice soundly outperformed 10-month-old freely fed mice in this respect. Calorically restricted mice also followed a circadian cycle more than their unrestricted counterparts, and they chose to run more when possible. While all the groups lost muscle strength with aging at roughly the same rate, caloric restriction promoted a fast-to-slow transition in muscle tissue. The researchers explained that slow-twitch muscle fibers are more resistant to age-related changes, and this study found that caloric restriction may have at least partially protected against sarcopenia in these mice. Overall, the results lend strong evidence to the idea that rapamycin and caloric restriction have completely different effects on muscle tissue and offer different benefits for different reasons. While even a combination of both did not wholly prevent sarcopenia in mice, it seemed to have a strong influence on these animals' muscle tissue and physical abilities, suggesting a possible low-hanging fruit in treating human frailty. A paper published in Geroscience has reported that older mice taking the well-known senolytic combination of dacetinib and quercetin are able to build muscle more like young mice. In this new study, the research sought to determine whether senolytics can help older organisms to build muscle through resistance training. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to get mice to the gym. Therefore, the researchers used an established technique of removing synergistic muscle tissue in order to spur the development of the targeted muscle. In this case, the plantaris. Sham surgeries, in which no tissue was actually removed, were performed on a control group. The researchers' main hypothesis that dacetinib and quercetin would increase muscle mass upon resistance training was shown to be correct. Older mice given this senolytic combination and the surgery had greater plantaris muscle mass and superior fiber characteristics to the older mice given only the surgery. However, this comes with an important caveat. Older mice that received the treatment but only received the sham surgery, which did not impart resistance effects on their plantaris muscles, actually had muscles that were weaker or equal to the mice that did not receive treatment at all. 
In other words, in the absence of resistance training, senolytics were not shown to be of any benefit and may have even have caused harm below the level of statistical significance. The finding that senolytics may only have value in building muscle when combined with resistance exercise is important and will certainly guide future trial design. If the results found in mice are recapitulated in human beings, a senolytic and exercise combination may be prescribed in the near future in order to give older people back some of their mobility and fight back against frailty. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. You can also visit our website, lifespan.io, for some new interviews, including one with a doctor who prescribes the well-known drug naltrexone for a variety of conditions and is currently enrolling patients in clinical trials for its potential longevity benefits as well as possible effectiveness against the lingering effects of COVID-19. Moving on, what long-term projects might you undertake if you could expect a much longer life? Our latest Lifespan doc has just been released and it features Doug Vakach of Medi, who wishes to live longer to potentially receive responses to the interstellar messages that his team is sending out. Here's a bit of what he had to say. My name is Doug Vakach. I'm president of Medi, an organization dedicated to messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, uh, when I was a kid uh, in my teens, I uh, heard about uh, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And the thing that really crystallized it was I did a science fair project uh, where I designed messages to uh, life on other planets. So I was very interested as a teenager in science. I wanted to understand more about the world around me. It's, it is virtually inconceivable to me that there isn't intelligence somewhere in the universe. And to me, it's just numbers. I mean, there are over a hundred billion stars in our galaxy alone. And we know that stars have at least one planet on average. Maybe one out of five of those star systems has a potentially habitable Earth-like planet. So billions of planets that could be inhabited in our galaxy, and then billions of other galaxies. So. I don't believe in miracles. And so it would really be a miracle if out of all of those stars, ours was the only one that had planets that bear life and that becomes intelligent. When we look for targets for our many transmissions, we're looking for stars that have planets that could support life. So, you know, when we look at an, an interesting target for us called uh, TRAPPIST-1, we see that there are seven planets, roughly Earth-sized, and three of them are in the habitable zone. So there are some that are closer in where it's gonna be too hot, water's gonna boil away. Some of the ones that are very far out are going to just be frozen. There's not gonna be any way that it could support life. But in that intermediate zone, the Goldilocks zone, that's where there could be habitable planets. When we send radio signals to TRAPPIST-1, our message will focus directly on habitability specifically the ways that we are threatening the habitability of our own world, Earth. When I look at TRAPPIST-1 and imagine 40 years from now they get our message and then send a reply, um, it's kind of poignant to imagine it because in all likelihood I will be dead. Um, I would have to be 140 years old I mean, if there is a new technology that would let me live that long, that would be a game changer. I imagine death is just the end of things for me. Uh, and so it's not something I like because I really like the stuff that I'm doing. So it, it seems sad that someday I'm not gonna be around doing these things. Um, I guess from my perspective, I just think I won't exist after death. If the natural process of aging could be reversed, if I could be even restored to what I felt like I, when I was 20, that would be fantastic. I'd have even more energy for doing that. Um, so I would embrace it wholeheartedly, both for uh, just the enjoyment of life, but honestly, I don't expect I'm ever going to retire. 
I mean, I'm doing what I do because I love it. You know, sometimes people uh, act as if without death, life has no meaning because, you know, everything is defined by this end point. But, you know, we have chapters in our lives. We have um, events that will break our lives apart and give meaning, uh, different uh, stages of our life. And so right now we may look at death and, you know, try to justify why it's a good thing by saying, you know, this gives us meaning in life and it makes us accelerate our activities and do the things that are most important to us. Maybe we'll be able to do even more important things. We'll be able to take on even greater challenges if we have a confidence that we're going to be around much longer than we are right now. You can find the full video on our Lifespan YouTube channel. This short documentary was created by Tim Maupin, the same person behind our Science to Save the World videos. More videos in that series were also released recently, including one on the potential of using solar panels at night, and one on the possibility of using ultrasound to combat diabetes. We've also released new episodes of Lifespan News, including an episode discussing some alarming research suggesting that metformin is linked to birth defects, and another episode featuring a dive into what we can all do to improve the image of life extension science. Another video explores the idea that in a future without aging, we may choose to interact with the world through digital and robotic avatars to limit our risk of accidental death. This might sound like a strange concept, but it has a lot of thought behind it. Here's some of that video. According to the CDC, in the United States alone, there were well over 14 million years of potential life lost due to fatal accidental injuries between 2016 and 2020. This includes things such as traffic accidents, falls, workplace mishaps, drowning, and more. And that's not including the over 3 million years of potential life lost due to homicide. Add in the amount of years of lost life from diseases that people can pick up in public, or the years of life lost that stem from injuries and ailments that themselves weren't fatal, and it's clear. The world is a dangerous place. Every time we ride in a vehicle, we are increasing our risk of injury and death, but most of us choose to do this. To justify this, we must believe that the benefits of using the vehicle, such as getting to where we want to go more quickly, and having access to more areas, are worth the risks. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And maybe, if people only expect to live around 80 years, taking those risks makes sense. After all, you only have so many years to cram a lot of experiences and accomplishments into. And in a worst case scenario, you risk cutting a few decades off your life. But what if we expected to live 800 years rather than 80? Would your calculations change? Maybe in that case, riding in a car, or risking exposure to pathogens, or engaging in risky sports doesn't make as much sense. After all, you now have more to lose, and your time for potential accomplishments and experiences is increased. Now forget 800 years. What if there was no limit? What if you could remain alive as long as you could avoid death from an accident? Would you ever want to get in a car again? If we are able to overcome aging and disease, which is what we're working towards, these questions stop becoming hypothetical and start becoming very real. And this is where avatars come in. As virtual worlds become more immersive and interactive, and as robots progress and become more capable, it becomes easy to imagine a scenario in which humans with unlimited lifespans choose to prioritize the safety of their physical bodies and brains over everything else, remaining in a safe bunker and interacting with broader society only through digital or robotic avatars. For many people, this may not sound like a life worth living. They may say that they would never want to give up on experiencing the smells, the breeze, the tactile sensations of a forest, or a beach, or the great cities of the world. And they may not want to miss the connection of experiencing a concert, or sporting event, or art museum, or simply being together with friends. And that is completely understandable, but it also may fail to account for just how immersive the experiences that avatars provide could soon be. These sights, sounds, smells, and sensations may be convincingly duplicated. Or even if they can't, your brain could be stimulated to the point that it can't tell the difference. How close to perfect would these systems have to be for you, personally, to decide that the risk of losing an unlimited lifespan is not one worth taking? You can find these and more episodes of Lifespan News on their YouTube channel. Finishing things up with a news nugget. 
Elastrin Therapeutics, a privately held biotechnology company leveraging a platform seeking to develop therapeutics that restore calcified tissue and organs, announced the closing of a $10 million funding round led by Kizu Technology Capital. As part of Michael Greaves Forever Healthy Group, Kizu provides seed and follow-on financing with a focus on rejuvenation biotech and directly supports the creation of startups, turning promising research into therapies and services for human application. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast.